glass industry internationally, I don't know anyone more important than Russ Ebert. I really don't. Um, your reputation is, is worldwide. Russ, where's the industry going? I, I know where for a contract glazer, I think it's going. But where, where, and you're much brighter than I am, where's it going? Boy, you said the right words when you said brighter, but it also shows your integrity gap. You're a liar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, many years ago, when I guess we were both kind of youngins, the glass maker was the king. Right. He dictated the terms. There were very few of them, what have you. Then over the years, what happened is it moved to the fabricators and the window people. They started, uh, all these ma and pa shops started uh, purchasing uh, or selling out to the corporate. So there was a lot of consolidation, and they did it for purchasing power. They really didn't bring much to the trade in terms of innovative practices, additional services, or anything like that. They figured they'd make more money mainly by buying bigger volume. And of course, some manufacturers fell for that. So what happened is you started to get a striation of manufacturers who went more downstream and value-added products to those who would just sell volumes at cheaper prices. And I think what you're finding over the longer term is those that sold strictly on cheaper prices are phasing out. But this is a passing phase, my belief anyway. The next step is, and I think you're seeing it in your area, the glazers becoming important. Right. The uh, architects don't buy anything, but you need them for specs. The fabricators, they're all, especially now, hungry for business, and price is not an object, they're just trying to keep busy. But the glazer has loyalty to good fabricators, and price point, while always important, is not the determining factor because they want reliable service, right. good quality. They want to close up that building and get the final check. So that loyalty, if you're good, really works. I think that's the phase we're entering now. Now I think there's a fourth phase, and that's where the consumer will dictate. And to use an analogy, if you went to a hardware store and you wanted to buy a tape measure, and there was a Stanley tape measure and an Acme tape measure, same price, which would you buy? Yeah, it's an obvious one. You'd buy the Stanley Every one. Every time. So now you get into branding, consumer recognition. Uh, if the housewife wants a box of Tide, she doesn't care what store handles it. She goes and she wants Tide, whether it's the corner grocery store or the big supermarket. So that's where I think the brand recognition and the trade is going, where the consumer will dictate uh, the choice of product. Instead of a supply chain, Yes. this is, becomes a, a brand or a loyalty yes. or a, a, so. a feel-good chain. In yeah. some cases, it is, it's all is in some cases. And we work very hard to make our customers feel good you know, about us. But that's worth a lot because this comes not by slick advertising, it comes right. by being consistent, performance. reliable performance. Yeah. Uh, do the big fabricators end up becoming glazing contractors? Well, <clears throat> Let me give you an analogy, maybe, and then you can apply it to your end. Uh, if you'll notice, while Guardian is a big glassmaker and a fabricator, we've not gone into distribution, right. retailing in any measurable way. We've dabbled in it only to know the price points at that level, but never to really run it as a business. You're referring to auto glass? Auto glass or distributor shops, okay. uh, things like that. And, and at least my belief is the most important link is between that man and the customer. And big companies have a way of siphoning the good people to the top, yes. leaving the dregs at the bottom, which is the most important element is the customer. So I think anybody who goes too far downstream defeats themselves. Ah, interesting. Uh, solar glazing, solar voltaic glazing, the technologies, 
for guys like me, and and I, you know, and I and I've been around a long time. So when I say I think the future for our company is in that arena or that area, I, I recognize that it's a short future for me. I, the guys that are 20 years younger than me, I, you know, they're they're the future, not me. But where's that going? It is only one percent of float sales today. So if th that's what I'm getting at. The hype is far bigger than the practicality. Now that's the negative. Anything you hear about solar, go to sleep for another year or two and then part of it will change and become reality. But it is coming. It's on an irreversible path, yep. but very slow. Because the technology has to continue to improve to make it effective. Right now, for it to be effective, you need these feed-in tariffs subsidies from government to promote it and push it. Until you get down to 10, 11 cents a kilowatt hour, it does not pay for itself. This industry solar is developing at about a three to five year pace in, in terms of leaps forward. So it is coming. I would say we're probably five to seven years away from the hype matching the facts. Now, there'll be tremendous uh, opportunities because these are big, big projects. Uh, and what will happen is those who have spent early money getting prepared, and that's a danger because you can also spend foolish money being prepared for nothing. Uh, but those who are prepared will reap some big bucks, but it will be less than what is it, your stomach is not as big as your eyes? Yeah, or your appetite <laughs> or, or whatever. Yeah. yeah, sure. And that's the way this that's industry way will be. Yes, we, we are in dealing with about 45 different companies around the world. Uh, there are about five to seven techno technologies. Which one will be best, don't know. So we're placing small bets on all seven not betting a house on one because that may be a loser. So we're trying to play the field till the field narrows down and then we'll double down. Your life is good, you're happy, you're satisfied. Uh, I wish I could do it over again because yeah. uh, to me, first. Take the whole wallet by the way. It's <laughs> <laughs> I, now I've been with Guardian 40 years. It feels like 10 or 12. Yep. It's almost like an e-ride at Disney World. Uh, it's hard to believe where the time went, but it couldn't have went better. And I almost feel I wish I had another 40. Yep. Yep. Because I think Guardian has gone from a flaming maverick to now, I hope, an innovative leader. Absolutely. And then uh, my goal, I told this to Ernie, to other people, I hope when you see the galloping horse that people will recognize whether it's a windshield, whether it's a mirror, whether it's solar, it's a quality product yeah. that's consistent. Yeah. That's my goal. I, I, I think you might be I think you might be there, at least in certain circles. Not maybe yet with the consumer, the end user, but certainly at a certain level you are there. You really are, Russ. And I, you and you really are an industry legend. All that all that fluffy stuff in the beginning of this interview, I, I meant that you are who you are and uh, and recognized for making a heck of a contribution to this industry. Well, I've always tried to be straight with people because a glass plant, it isn't like a trailer that you move around. Right. You're there, right. 35 feet into the ground. and. You might fool someone once, but once he catches on, you're gonzo. So it pays to be straight with them, although frequently I've gotten in trouble because they don't like the answer that they right, want. Right. And my comment is, at least you know where I stand, and now you can dodge around <laughs> me <laughs> if you want. So I've always looked at it from the customer point of view, even though he doesn't like the answer, because in business, your only currency is your reputation. That's right.